Good evening. This 86th meeting of the 72nd term of the Baltimore City Council is now called to order. Uh, members of the council, due to us being in a virtual meeting of the coronavirus, please note that I will recognize you by saying you have the floor. Once I recognize you, you may state your name and begin talking. Tonight's invocation will be delivered by Robin Turner, new pastor of New Hope Baptist Church, which will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor Turner. Thank you. Greetings, my sisters and my brothers. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to you with humble and grateful hearts, realizing that we move, breathe, and have our being through you. Lord, we thank you for our city council, our mayor, and us, and all the, our leaders in the city, God. We pray, God, that you will give them the wisdom and knowledge, God, to continue to guide us to brighter and better days. God, we pray for divine peace. We pray for divine progression. We pray for divine provision. And we pray for divine providence, God, that you would keep us safe, God, and that you would continue to bless Baltimore City. God, again, we say thank you. We pray for every neighborhood, every community, every community leader. We pray for every department and every department leader, God, that they will grasp hold of the wisdom and analysis they, that they need to work together in unity. God, these are the things that we ask in your precious and holy name, and we all say amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again, Pastor. Uh, tonight's showcase Baltimore presenter is Sam McClure of the LGBT Health Resource Center of Chase Braxton. Uh, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, good evening. Excellent. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting us to come and speak with you tonight. It's an honor and a privilege. Um, I am the director of the LGBT Health Resource Center of Chase Brexton Healthcare. I want to share a little bit with you about uh, our history and what we do in the organization, and then I would welcome an opportunity to answer any of your questions that may arise. <clears throat> I'm sure most of you are aware of Chase Brexton Healthcare's uh, rather storied history. We were founded in 1978 by the gay community as a health center responding to a gay men's health crisis. This was actually just previous to uh, the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. And as a result of that, Chase Brexton was right on the front line, ready to step in and take uh, what would become a very large role in responding to HIV and AIDS. If you fast forward 41 years, um, Chase Brexton Healthcare is a very large federally qualified health center. Uh, we became an FQHC in 1999. The way I like to think about our history is that uh, we were founded by what was then called the gay community, which would now be called the LGBTQ plus community. And then after a number of years of service, uh, that community literally gave Chase Brexton to the larger city of Baltimore. And we served, uh, Close to 40,000 patients in the state of Maryland. We have five locations, and uh, we're, we're very proud of the work we do. And I, I think, as all of you know, we treat all patients regardless of their ability to pay. Uh, we probably have one of the most diverse patient populations anywhere in the country, and we're very proud of that and enjoy stepping up to the challenges presented by our mission. Now, the Resource Center, which I run, is a division that sees Overseas LGBT healthcare. Uh, in my unit, we have a behavioral health team. We have multiple support groups. We have both adult and pediatric gender care for our transgender populations. And we also have a program called Elder Pride, which is anchored in taking care of our LGBT elders. Now, at Chase Brexton, we actually define elder as anyone over 50. Uh, so when I came to work at Chase Brooks and I was surprised to learn that I'm already an elder, um, but uh, pleased at that. And we start at that age, which is different than many organizations would define a senior, because we know based on health disparities, uh, LGBTQ people and people aging with HIV 
age differently, require different services at earlier ages. Within the Elder Pride program, we also have um, an event called National Honor Our LGBT Elders Day. It's actually a national day of commemoration. It was founded right here in Baltimore, right inside of the division that I now run. It's now celebrated all over the world, uh, and we are just proud to continue to uh, lead that tradition. Uh, we also have a training and education division in the Resource Center, and we have a health equity training team. And the purpose of that training team is to ensure that all healthcare providers have access to information on how to take care of LGBTQ plus patients. Uh, it might surprise you to know that um, um, very little, sometimes no information at all, is given during medical training about how to take care of this ever-growing patient population. So we do a lot of training in that area. I, was, I looked back at some data on uh, how many people we trained in the last year, and it was a little over 1,000 uh, medical providers that we've trained, and, and we give them continuing ed education credits and detailed information, uh, specifically on, I think the most popular requests we get are to teach transgender healthcare and also to teach um, cultural competency for taking care of LGBTQ plus elders. We teach both medical providers and behavioral health providers as well. Occasionally, we'll get an invitation from um, a government agency or a social work agency, health and human services types of organizations, and more and more we get opportunities to speak inside of large employers who are looking to improve their uh, cultural competency and uh, principles and cultural behavior around uh, inclusion, equity, and diversity. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it at that and, and take questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for all, thank you for all your great work. Uh, roll call. The clerk will now call the roll of the members. President Scott. Yes. Councilman Cohen. Yes. Councilwoman McCray. Present. Councilman Dorsey. Councilman Present. Yeah. Councilman Henry. Here. Councilman Schleifer. Present. Vice President Middleton. Present. Councilman Pinkett. Present. Councilman Burnett. Present. Uh, Present. Uh, members, if you could please remember to uh, mute yourselves when you uh, ask spoken. Councilman Reisinger. Here. Councilman Costello. Present. Councilman Stokes. Present. Councilwoman Sneed. Here. Councilwoman Clark. Here. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thank you. We will now proceed with the adoption of the journal. Uh, without objection, the journal will be adopted. The journal is adopted. Uh, bills vetoed by the mayor uh, can be found on page two. Uh, last week, uh, these vetoes were read into the record, and now we will uh, take a vote and have the opportunity to override those vetoes. Uh, the clerk will read, read the, the bills into the record and take roll call vote. Mr. President, very briefly, um, the, the journals uh, that we just approved were for June 15, 2020, at the 5 p.m. meeting and the 6.30 meeting, and they were sent to the members' desks. The bills which have been uh, submitted back to the council, having been vetoed, are City Council Bill 19-0380, Charter Amendment vetoes. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock. Mr. Mr. You, look, two things, Caitlin, slow down. One, you have to read the entire thing. And second, uh, you have to we have to take a vote uh, with every with everyone. Is the roll call vote, Mr. President? Mr. President was just point of order calling for roll call. Yeah, it's yes. a roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. President. First yeah. veto of the of the term, Mr. President. Uh, for the purpose of modifying the vote by which the council may override a mayoral veto, repealing the mayoral authority to veto items of appropriation and submitting this amendment to the qualified voters of the city for adoption or rejection. President Scott. Yes. Councilman Cohen. Yes. Councilwoman McCray. 
Yeah. Councilman Dorsey. Yes. Councilman Henry. Yes. Councilman Schleifer. No. Vice President Middleton. Yes. Councilman Pinkett. Yes. Councilman Burnett. Yes. Hold on. Yes. Councilman Reisinger. Yes. Councilman Costello. No. Councilman Stokes. No. Councilwoman Sneed. Yes. Councilwoman Clark. Uh, did you hear me? Go ahead, Councilwoman. Oh, yeah. oh. Yes. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mr. President, you have 12 affirmative and three negative. All right. Uh, this bill is approved. City Council Bill 19-0467, Charter Amendment vetoes timing of override for the purpose of modifying and clarifying the time within which the council may consider to override a mayoral veto and submitting this amendment to the qualified voters of the city for adoption or rejection. President Scott. Mr. Yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, yes, Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. President. If I may just speak to this for just one moment. Go ahead, Council. Thank you. I just want to remind everybody of exactly what this bill does, that uh, that under the current uh, charter, we have to wait a minimum of five days, but not more than 20 days, just in order for a member of the council to be able to make a motion to override a veto. And what this amendment would do is allow that if there is no city council meeting occurring within that time frame, that at the next meeting after that time frame, not at a later date, but only at the next meeting after that time frame, then the city council may make that motion at that time. Uh, a member of the council may make that motion at that time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. President Scott. Yes. Councilman Cohen. Yes. Councilwoman McCray. Yes. Councilman Dorsey. Yes. Councilman Henry. Yes. Councilman Schleifer. Yes. Vice President Middleton. Yes. Councilman Pinkett. Yes. Councilman Burnett. Yes. Councilman Bullock. Yes. Councilman Reisinger. Yes. Councilman Costello. Yes. Councilman Stokes. Yes. Councilwoman Sneed. Yes. Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Unanimous, Mr. President. Thank you. The, the veto is written. The bill is approved. Uh, bill to be introduced. City Council Bill 20-0545, Charter Amendment, Term Limits. For the purpose of providing that a person who has served a certain number of terms as mayor, comptroller, president of the city council, or member of the city council is ineligible to again serve in that office during the immediately following term, correcting, clarifying, and conforming related provisions, and submitting this amendment to the qualified voters of the city for adoption or rejection. Sponsors, Slifer Burnett. Please add the council president as a co-sponsor, Councilman Henry, Councilman Snead, Councilman Cohen as co-sponsors to this legislation. Uh, I feel like I feel like we've been here before in this term, but chair recognizes Councilman Sir. Thank you, Mr. President. So uh, this is to uh, finish off the term the way we started. As you may recall, I introduced this bill in the beginning of this term at the first opportunity. And what this bill does is it's not a lifetime ban on how long you can serve. What it simply says is you can serve three consecutive terms as uh, city council, the comptroller, council president, or the mayor. Uh, you could move up or you could move out. Um, and then you could always come back if you'd like to. And so, you know, this is a responsible thing to do uh, for transparency and accountability. It's always good to have um, some degree of rotation going on. Um, and it's also important that as council people, we understand that we're going to be constituents one day ourselves. And so um, last time, uh, this bill did not go uh, the way I had hoped. And so I'm giving it another uh, try and hoping that I can count on at least one additional colleague to support it over the last time so we can get it passed. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, this is in time to the Judiciary Committee. City Council Bill 20-0546, Natural Resources, Forest and Tree Conservation, for the purpose of amending the Forest and Tree Conservation provisions of Article 7 of the Baltimore City Code to comply with new state requirements to coordinate with other city environmental requirements and to align the code with existing policy, correcting certain references, allowing for mitigation to be provided through forest mitigation banks located within the city, updating the requirement for mitigation fee usage, aligning the allowed usage of forest conservation funds with the definitions allowed by the state, adding annual reporting and biennial review requirements as required by the state, reducing the amount of required land that triggers a review to conform with the amount of required land for grading and building per or building permits, requiring that a forest stand delineation by an element of other reviews, including site plan review, subdivision, grading, and erosion, and sediment control, requiring that all grading or building permits and sediment and erosion control subdivision or development plan approvals be conditioned on approval of and compliance with an approved forest conservation plan, modifying mitigation fees to conform with critical area and landscape manual mitigation fees, and modifying the amount of violation fees, fines, adding a definition for a critical root zone to the code, and modifying the definition of specimen tree, allowing notifications to applicants to be sent by email, adding a specimen tree mitigation policy to the code, requiring that applicants notify adjacent property owners for significant impacts to on-site specimen trees, establishing a procedure with criteria and requirements for modifying existing forest conservation easements, clarifying that variances may be granted in advance of activity requiring forest conservation approval and that variances may not be granted after violation of the provisions of this code and generally relating to forest and tree conservation and approving and adopting a new Baltimore City Forest Conservation Manual. Sponsors, President, on behalf of the administration, Bullock Dorsey. Please add uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Clark, Councilman Burnett, Councilwoman Sneed, Councilman Henry, uh, Councilman Cohen as co-sponsors. Uh, this has been assigned to the Judiciary Committee. And without objection, we had a, a, a mistake. Without objection, we are going to assign Bill 20-0545, Charter Amendment Term Limits, to the uh, Equity and Structure Committee without objection. Thank you. Uh, this last bill has been assigned to uh, the fourth four bill has been assigned to the assigned to the Judiciary Committee. City Council Bill 20-0547, amended effective date for Water Accountability and Equity Act for the purpose of modifying the effective date of Ordinance 20-0336, Water Accountability and Equity Act, and providing for a special effective date. Sponsor, President, on behalf of the administration. Thank you. This has been assigned to the Taxation, Finance, and Economic Development Committee. City Council Bill 20-0548, Landmark List, Reed Calloway House. For the purpose of redesigning, excuse me, re, excuse me, for the purpose of designating uh, the Reed Calloway House, 1316 North Cary Street, and as an historic landmark exterior. Sponsors, Pinkett, Burnett, Clark. Please add the council president as a co-sponsor. Uh, chair recognizes Councilman Pinkett. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, over the past, I guess, couple years now, there's been much debate as it relates to um, the residents of Cab Calloway um, in Baltimore, um, especially as it relates to the 2200 block of George Hill Avenue. Uh, this particular property at 1316 uh, North Care Street um, is um, a special property in the life of Cab Calloway. Not only was it his residence for a time, it was also the home of his maternal grandmother, Annie Reed, who was given credit for developing the musical talent in Cap Calloway. Even in his writings, he described um, this particular time in his life fondly um, as a place that um, he enjoyed living and um, the growth that he had um, growing up in her, home, her household. This property is about a block off of Pennsylvania Avenue, um, so it really lines up with support, and it's on a revitalization block, so it really lines up with supporting 
the restoration that's already happening on Pennsylvania Avenue, as well as supporting the Black Arts and Entertainment District that is recently developed there. I'm so excited about this particular property. Cab lived in about six or seven different locations um, when he was in Baltimore, and, and this is one of the key locations in his life. And so we want to make certain that this property uh, receives its proper landmark designation. Thank you, Mr. President. Please uh, add Councilman Ryan as a co-sponsor, Councilman Gossi, Council Vice President Milton, uh, Councilman Stokes as co-sponsor, uh, Councilman Cullen as a co-sponsor. This has been assigned to the Housing and Urban Affairs Committee. City Council Bill 20-0549, City Property, renaming the Columbus Obelisk Monument to the Police Violence Victims Monument. For the purpose of changing the name of the Columbus Obelisk Monument located at Heinz Park to the Police Violence Victims Monument. Sponsor, Dorsey. Chair recognizes Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Council President. Um, I hope that folks will take the time to read the recitals that were written in as a text of this bill. Um, you know, I put a lot of thought into that, but I don't want to take the time right now to read all of that, but I think it's worthwhile. Um, I just want to say that you know, if you're not familiar with this monument, this is a plain white obelisk standing in the center of a small park at a fairly busy intersection uh, called Heinz Park. And it's, 42, it's 44 feet tall, and it's the oldest monument to Columbus um, that we know of in the United States. Um, this is not its, its, its original location. It was relocated here in 1964. Um, most of you or all of you will recall that a couple of years ago, there was a video made of somebody um, hitting this monument with a sledgehammer, uh, cracking the placard inset in it into pieces. That has since been removed. Um, and the damaged area restored, but no placard in that place any any longer. Um, in the period short, shortly after that, um, there was a lot of community discussion about the potential to rededicate this. Um, and I, I did a survey and I talked to a lot of people and there was no real emerging consensus about it. And I wasn't being lobbied to do anything in any forceful way by anybody. Um, so it kind of sat on the back burner for a while. And I'm putting this forth today because as we close the end of this term, I've spent the better part of four years being told by many, why don't you do something about? And often these questions, these statements, this prodding is followed by things that the city council has no statutory power over, specifically when it comes to the police department. Um, we cannot reform the law enforcement officer's bill of rights here at the city level, but it should be reformed. And if we had it here at the city level uh, to change, I would participate or lead any effort in order to do that. We cannot pass laws on our police department in general here at the local level. There is little that we could do. For instance, if we wanted to, we could not pass laws prohibiting certain types of chokeholds, prohibiting the use of rubber bullets, which are just bullets that are covered with rubber. We could not at the local level here pass a law banning no-knock warrants. There is little to nothing that we have statutory power to be able to do to affect police violence. And so to simply name a, no a monument to honor the victims and the families and the communities traumatized by police violence, an epidemic as I see it, is really the least 
and in many ways the most of what we can do. And so the better when it is to repurpose a monument that has stood for more than 200 years to the lie of Columbus as a hero, the mythologizing, the rewriting of fictional history of somebody as somebody we should lift up. Um, and so I thank anybody and everybody for your support on this. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud and thankful to be able to put this um, forth today. Thank you. Please add the council president as a co-sponsor. Uh, Councilman Henry, Councilman Pinkett as co-sponsors. Uh, thank you. This has been the sign of oh, Councilman Burnett as a co-sponsor. Uh, Councilman Sneed, uh, this has been assigned to the Housing and Urban Affairs Committee. Resolutions, resolutions to be introduced. City Council Resolution 20-0232R, request for state action. Governor Hogan and evictions for the purpose of calling on Governor Hogan to allocate at least $175 million for rental assistance and eviction prevention in Maryland from coronavirus relief funds or another source to expand the eviction moratorium to call to cover all types of eviction cases and to extend the moratorium until the public health emergency has ended and sufficient financial assistance is available for residents to avoid eviction and to take all other necessary steps to prevent homelessness and evictions during the public health emergency. Sponsors, Henry, Bullock, Clark, Sneed, Burnett, Middleton. Please add the council president as a co-sponsor, Councilman Pinkett, Councilman uh, Cohen, Councilman Stokes as a co-sponsor, Councilman Reisinger as a co-sponsor. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilman Henry. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to all my co-sponsors. Uh, as, as the resolution itself points out, the rent delinquency rates for this May are literally twice what they were a year ago. Um, I, I don't know that I need to go into details in hammering home uh, just what a crushing blow to the economy the pandemic has been, but I do think the point is worth making that the essential workers who are disproportionately black and brown families have been the hardest hit. Uh, in Baltimore City alone, over 50,000 residents are at risk of eviction when those evictions resume uh, in late July, uh, as, as is currently expected. Uh, Mayor Young, on behalf of the city, has announced the creation of a $13 million city rental assistance program. Um, that's going to be uh, very useful, very needed, but the best calculations say that there's probably closer to three times that need here in the city. And the state of Maryland has $1.3 billion in funds from the federal government, some of which could be made available for this purpose as other states have done. And so this is uh, Baltimore City, hopefully joining with other subdivisions around the state, calling upon Governor Hogan to immediately start moving some of that money into a program to help people uh, keep their homes. And uh, I would like to uh, motion to suspend the rules and permit immediate adoption of this resolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Councilman Henry. And we also, I will also note that we also have to continue to try to push for a federal uh, uh, action on this same very issue as we had before here in the council we know this is an issue that really should be coming uh, from the highest of the high in American government. Well, without objection, the rules will be suspended. The rules are suspended. Roll call. President Scott. Yes. Councilman Cohen. Yes, sir. Councilwoman McCray. Yeah. Councilman Dorsey. Yes. Councilman Henry. Yes. Councilman Schleifer. Yes. Vice President Middleton. We'll come back to the vice president. Her signal is a little bit down. Uh, Councilman Pinkett. Yes. Councilman Burnett. Yes. Councilman Bullock. Yes. Councilman Reisinger. Oh. Yes. Madam Vice President, you're back. Yes, I'm back. And your vote. Thank you. That is a yay. Councilman Costello. 
Yes. Councilman Stokes. Yes. Councilwoman Sweet. Yes. Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the ayes have it. The motion is approved. The res this resolution has been adopted. Uh, committee reports. We will now move to build on second reader. And before I do that, I want to recognize Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that we read short titles for second and third reader for the duration of the meeting. Without objection, we will read short titles for the remainder of the meeting. Short titles will be read for the remainder of the meeting. Equity and Structure Committee. City Council Bill 19-0379, Charter Amendment Ordinance of Estimates. Chair recognizes Councilman Henry. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this charter amendment has come out of committee uh, favorable with uh, several amendments. I also have uh, an amendment on the floor that needs to be offered. Uh, taking the committee amendments first, uh, the committee amendments were done uh, after much consultation and uh, discussion with the administration, uh, specifically the departments of law and finance. Uh, they address a number of logistical concerns that the finance department and the law department had with uh, basically how this charter amendment will work. And uh, to give a quick summary of this charter amendment to anyone who has not been following the game at home, uh, this charter amendment would allow the council to not only cut money from the budget, but also move that money to other budget lines inside the context of a given uh, of a given ordinance of estimates. The amendments that are before you that the committee has already approved uh, put some specific restraints on how that money can be moved. Uh, the council literally doesn't do things that really couldn't be done, like cut money from one fund and add it to um, another fund that it, it can't actually be used for. Um, but uh, what it would do is it would allow the council to do what it isn't allowed to do this year and has not been allowed to do in any previous year, which is when we know that there are things the city should be spending money on and the people agree that there are things that the city isn't choosing to spend money on that need the city's work and commitment, it would give the council the legal ability to make a cut somewhere, painful as it might be, and reallocate those funds to a specific use. In the case of this year, the council made a number of cuts to the police department and other entities, money that could now be used by the administration if it chose to restore the cuts made to the fire department and keep open two fire companies that are scheduled for closure in the coming weeks or months. Um, it's been very clear from the reaction that people don't want those fire companies to go away. And the council agreed with them, and yet the mayor chooses or has chosen so far not to restore those cuts. If this charter amendment were in place, the council would have had the opportunity to just move that money ourselves. The mayor would have had the opportunity to veto those cuts and reallocations, just as the mayor has that power now, and the council would have the power to override those vetoes if the commitment in the council was strong enough, as, for example, we've just done earlier tonight. This is truly an opportunity to restore something like a check and balance on the mayor's budgetary power in a way that most people think we can and are often disappointed to learn that we cannot. So I ask my colleagues to support this charter amendment. Uh, I understand that there are people who are still trying to uh, make certain that they've got all of the different parts of this going together. So I'm not going to ask for it to be double read tonight. 
um, but I am going to move the committee amendments on this bill as it comes out on second reader. So, Mr. President, I move the amendments. Thank you. All those in favor of approving the amendments say aye. 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 All aye. Those in favor, say nay. Aye. Chair recognizes Councilman Henry. Thank you, Mr. President. There's also a floor amendment um, that uh, I'm offering on behalf of your office. Uh, we understand that this is going to involve a huge culture shift for all of the agencies, um, but especially the budget department as it you know, cha literally changes the process for how the budgets should be constructed. And so uh, the amendment I'm offering from the floor changes the effective date on this amendment so that if the if, if we pass this, if it's signed by the mayor or vetoed but then overridden and proceeds to the voters of Baltimore City in November and they ratify it, it would go into effect in July of 2022 and give the next administration one full budget cycle to have a new budget with hopefully a new, more inclusive budget process working with the council. Because as many of us have discussed over the years, if the council were involved earlier in the budget formulation process, we probably would have fewer complaints and conflicts at the very end. Because as we've been doing this over the years, that's the only time the council comes into the budget process right now. Um, so this amendment would basically put off the implementation of this change until 2022. And I move the amendment. Uh, thank you. All those in favor of approving the amendment say aye. 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 I abstain. I'm, I'm going to abstain out of respect for the president's office that recommended it and the chairman who's recommending it as well. But we're all right now explaining every day by email to an awful lot of advocates out there that we don't have this power. But there's a charter amendment coming. The vote, we hope, is in November 3rd, the general election. And that the time we come full cycle to next year's budget um, deliberations, we will have the powers that people think we already have. So I'm I'm not voting against this amendment out of respect for the two principles of the decision. But uh, I sure can't vote for it because I sure have told people to vote for this amendment in November so that next year is different from any year that's ever been. Thank you. Thank you. Please note Councilman Clark as an abstention. Uh, all those opposed say nay. Thank you. Uh, this amendment is approved. Chair recognizes Councilman Henry. Thank you, Mr. President. I move this charter amendment as amended favorably. All those in favor of approving this uh, bill say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Say nay. Mr. President, I'd like to explain my vote. He recognizes Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, I'm going to vote yes on this. Uh, first, I'm going to vote yes on this. Um, I uh, would like to say from the perspective of the person who's chaired the budget committee for the past four years that we have made a lot of progress in terms of getting things uh, included in the budget that the council has thought to be important. Uh, those efforts have resulted in pretty fruitful negotiations uh, with the administration uh, the previous uh, three years. I think this year was a bit of an outlier. Um, but I, I certainly welcome the opportunity for the council to play a more meaningful role uh, in the in the development of the budget in our city, um, 
that being said, um, I would caution everyone, and I want the record to reflect this, um, what the potential unintended consequences of this action are. Uh, this upcoming year, we have $380 million in debt service. Uh, that's essentially uh, in the range of two to four and a half percent, depending on uh, where the funding is, is what activity it's, it's funding, uh, when bonds were put to market, what the conditions were at the time of that. Um, if uh, the bond rating agencies uh, were to decide to downgrade our bond rating from a double A currently to a single A, uh, that could have a disastrous effect on our city's budget. I'll note that just last week, uh, we were able to sell bonds at 2%, uh, which as I understand it, is the lowest rate that we've been able to do that uh, in uh, decades. And that is partly due to, in fact, the uh, fiscal prudence that uh, the mayor and previous mayors and the current council and previous councils have demonstrated literally over generations to get us to the point where we're able to borrow money so cheaply. Um, and for those who aren't well-versed in, in bond ratings, um, I would offer up the following example. Uh, the debt service that we have is essentially a credit card. Uh, a family may have a credit card with a credit card balance at $10,000 at 14.99%, which is a, a average rate, at uh, $250 a month per payment. Uh, they end up paying $13,945. If that rate were to be increased to say 19.99%, instead of paying $13,900, they would end up paying $16,609. I know the bond rating is something that we consistently talk about, and sometimes uh, there's a feeling that that bond rating does not impact us or does not impact our budgetary situation. But it very much does. Uh, and when we look at the things that we are trying to fund in Baltimore City, and we know that there are more things that we want to fund than we have the dollars to fund. There are more things we want to fund than we have the available credit to take out in order to be able to fund. And I just want to caution everyone about this. And I hope that in the very near future, we can have some type of study that will shed some light on what the impact of, of this decision is that we're making today which is going to have significant impacts, and I'm not suggesting negative, but it's going to have significant impacts on the way that our government operates. So again, Mr. President, I vote yes, and thank you for the opportunity to explain my vote. Thank you. Councilman McCurry? No, and I would like to explain my vote. I do think that Councilman Costello hit on one of the notes when we're talking about debt service and our bond rating. As one of the one of three other members of this committee and sitting through hours of this committee's testimony, um, making sure that our bond rating is intact and knowing that this may potentially impact this city and we are going through a global pandemic right now, I cannot vote no. The other reason that I will not be voting no is that we have had barely any, barely any public testimony on any of these charter amendments. Many of these charter amendments, I feel, need to go through a charter review commission. Going forward, I will not be voting yes on any further charter amendments that come out of this committee. Again, we have had very little public input. And to sit here and talk about a, dig a digital divide for students and not talk about a digital divide for families who are not a part of this is very concerning to me. I vote no. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair okay, recognizes Councilman Stokes. Y yes, I agree with my um, um, colleague, Councilwoman McCray. Uh, we talk about transparency here, and this is just serious. And we need, to, when we talk about child amendments, we need to vet this out to the community because it's going to affect them. So I agree with my colleague. Councilman Cray, if we're not going to um, vet these charter amendments, I would be voting no on those charter amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilwoman Snead. I'm, uh, 
I don't have an explanation other than to um, say that I'm going to vote, change my vote to no because what's at stake right now. And since I won't be here in the future to fully defend what's going to happen in this council, uh, I, I do know that uh, we have the best person who's up to be our mayor to make some good decisions, and I'm confident um, that he will do that. So I'm going to switch my vote to no. Thank you. Uh, please note Councilman Stokes, Councilman Craig, Councilman Sneed as no, Councilman Clark as an abstention. Uh, this and, oh, that's on the amendment, right? No, this is. Oh, yeah. we're on the bill, right? This is on the bill. Oh, yeah. As a, no, you're right. Sorry about that, Councilman Clark. Please note. Oh, we did the amendment. Yeah. And now we're on the bill as amended, right? Oh, no. Because that's what I'd like to talk about. Um, if I may, in explaining my vote on the bill as amended, is that where we are? Yeah. I got it lost. Yeah, Councilwoman Clark, go ahead. Well, let me just tell you why I'm voting yes. This is a very safe, balanced legislation. Now, council, my council friend, the head of the committee, used to work in an office I shared with him. He gave me a rubber stamp, and it said, charter lover. Yes, I am a charter lover. I believe in a lot of strength for accountability by a mayor of a city. But this bill has got four walls around it and a ceiling to also. This bill says you cut a million dollars from X agency and you want that million to go to Y let's say, police to fire, for example. Um, if you do that, that, this bill, if approved, would allow that. But we are not allowed to increase the bottom line of the budget. We are not allowed to mess with any funds except general funds, which come from the tax rate of the city, we can't take some federal grant and cut it. We can't cut it and pass that money. That's not our money, general fund. That's not covered. So basically, this is a balance of power. It is not, it is okay for a charter lover to vote for. And in fact, I think it's long overdue for us to have, we are all grown, elected, people with responsibilities and they're not going to let the law wouldn't let us go below you can't you can't go below or above you've got to hit the bottom line that the city hands us to begin with we can't increase it we can't i guess we could cut it short but we can't raise the expenses of the budget. It's not allowed in this law. So my gosh, everybody, let's, let's, let's exercise the kind of, uh, the kind of legislative authority that our constituents already think we have and we should as their legislators. Thank you very much. I vote yes. Thank you, thank you, Councilwoman Clark. Uh, the no's are Councilman Stokes, Councilwoman McCray, Councilman Sneed. Uh, this bill moves to third reader, second reader. I'm sorry. This will oh, move to third. Yeah, moves to third reader. All right, Executive Appointments Committee. EA twenty zero two seven one. Daniel A. Greenberg, Member, Commission on Disabilities, District Five. Chair recognizes Councilman Stokes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The committee held a hearing on June the, June the 17th, 2020. I moved the nomination favorable. All those in favor of approving this nomination say aye. 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 All those say nay. Mr. Council President. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilman Dorsey. Uh, I have no idea how much public testimony was given on this executive appointments hearing. So just in principle, because I'm not sure about how much public testimony was given, I'm just going to vote no. 
Please note Councilman Dorsey as a no. The nomination is confirmed. Mr. Mr. President, I'd, I'd like to join as well. I can confirm there, there was no public testimony. No, no for me as well. Please note Councilman Burnett as a no. We're also joining my colleagues in voting no, as there was no public testimony in this nomination. Uh, Councilman Cohen as, as, a, as a no. And colleagues, just for the record, just to, just to make sure you guys know that you are voting no against the Commission on Disabilities. Uh, Chair yes. recognizes uh, this nomination is confirmed. Chair recognizes Councilman Stokes. The committee held a hearing on June the 20th. Um, I move the nomination favor. Mr. President, point of order. Uh, Chair recognizes. Oh, Councilman Stokes. I think the clerk needs yeah, to read that. The clerk. We're going to pause for one second. The clerk didn't read the uh, name. nomination. Pause one second, you guys. We're having uh, a little bit of technical difficulties here in City Hall, as you guys have all suffered through it before. Mr. Clerk. DA 20-0272, Michael King, member of Commission on Disabilities, District 2. He recognizes Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the nomination favorable. All those in favor of approving this nomination say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Mr. President. Dave recognizes Councilman Dorsey. Thank you. On the basis of my assumption that there was an insufficient amount of public public testimony on this bill and on this hearing, on this confirmation, I'm voting no on it. Please note Councilman Dorsey as a no. Thank you. EA 20-0274, member, Commission on Disabilities, District 12. And just a reminder for everyone to mute themselves. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the nomination favor. All those in favor of approving the nomination say aye. 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 All the polls say nay. Aye. Council Chair, President. Council Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Council President. The basic principle believing that there was probably an insufficient amount of public testimony on this bill. I'm going to put no. Thank you. Please, Council Dorsey, as a no. Hey, Mr. Mr. President, I'd like to abstain for the lack of public testimony at the hearing. Councilman Burnett as an abstention. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilman Sykes. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm a little confused. I've, I've sat on this executive appointment committee, uh, unfortunately, for the past four years. I don't really recall people ever coming in to testify unless it's like the police commissioner or a director. But I'm, I'm pretty sure public testimony, actually, I know it was available for anybody who did want to testify. Nobody logged in. Point of order. Chair yeah. recognize Councilwoman Clark. This committee. And basically we get we get a volume of background information on the candidates for office, as my colleague from the fifth district has indicated. Now, I don't know what this is about, and the reason it's a point of order is before we have another one of these meetings of executive appointments, I would like someone to explain what just happened. Because I don't think it's a reflection on any of the people I sat before uh, when they, these three people came in to accept uh, placement on the board of disabilities to help people with disabilities in this city and to do so at no compensation. So basically, my point of order is fine. Something's up about no outside witnesses. I think that we are basing a lot of our decisions on personal interviews and hearings and on background information that is provided to us in volume. Uh, before the hearings occur. So sometime between now and tomorrow, um, I would appreciate the president's office telling us 
what this is all about because it's not fair to the candidates. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Clark. I think that you would have to talk to our colleagues about their, their votes and how to not control uh, their votes. Uh, Mr. President, if I may, I know that. Yeah. Uh, so I would ask if a Councilwoman, delegation Councilwoman, would let me know. Yeah. Or Councilwoman Clark, sorry. Councilwoman Moore was speaking, and one of our other colleagues had his hand raised, too. No, I understand. Uh, Councilman Seifler? I'm going to refrain from saying what I want to say. Okay, Councilwoman McClough. Thank you. Uh, this nomination is confirmed. Land use committee. City Council Bill 19 0417, zoning, conditional use conversion of a single family dwelling unit to two dwelling units in the R8 zoning district, variances 1410 West Toronto Street. Chair recognizes Councilman Rosner. Mr. President, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I want to move the finding of facts. All those in favor of approving the findings of facts say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Aye. The findings of facts are approved. Chair recognizes Councilman Rosner. Mr. President, I move the bill favorable. All those in favor of approving this bill say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Aye. The motion is approved. This bill moves to third reading. City Council Bill 20 0494, zoning, conditional <coughs> use banquet hall, 5401 Bel Air Road. Crazy. Chair recognizes Councilman Rodriguez. Mr. President, I move the finding of facts. All those in favor of approving the findings of facts say aye. 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 All aye. In favor, nay. The findings of facts are approved. Mr. 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 President, this bill has amendments. I move the amendments. All those in favor of approving the amendments say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The amendments are approved. Chair recognizes Councilman Rosiger. Mr. President, I move the bill favorable as amended. All those in favor of approving this bill say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right. This bill is approved. Third reader for final passage. City Council Bill 19-0436, City Streets Closing, three 10-foot alleys, President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Weisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 19-0437, City Streets Opening, North Durham Street. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 19-0438, City Streets closing North Durham Street and a 16-foot alley. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0502, Woodbury Historic District, President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0506, Baltimore City Critical Area Management Program, Critical Area Manual, Map, and Zoning. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0511, sale of property, former bed of Cromwell Street. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0514, bond issue, affordable housing loan, $12 million. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. 
This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0515, bond issues, school loan, $38 million. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Roger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0516, bond issue, community and economic development loan, $38 million. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0517, bond issue, public infrastructure loan, loan $72 million. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer, Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. This bill is approved. City Council Bill 20-0534, sale of property, 5001 Ricestown Road, a.k.a. Langston Hughes Elementary School. President Scott, Cohen, McCray, Dorsey, Henry, Schleifer. No. Middleton, Pinkett, Burnett, Bullock, Reisinger, Costello, Stokes, Sneed, Clark. Uh, please know, Councilman Schleifer, as you know, uh, this bill is approved. Committee announcements. Uh, we will now move to committee announcements. I will uh, go starting with Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. President. The Biennial Audits Oversight Commission will hold a hearing on Wednesday, July 8th at 5 p.m. This will be a virtual WebEx meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to education and youth. Councilman Cohen, do you have anything? Not at the moment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Equity and structure, Councilman Henry. Not at this time, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Executive appointments, Councilman Stokes. You're on mute, Councilman. The President's Executive Appointments Committee will hold a hearing on Wednesday, June 24, 2020, at 10 a.m. To review the following nomination, Mayor's Commission on Disabilities for Kimberly Gray. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Councilman and the Health Committee. Uh, Councilman Burnett, do you have any for either of your two committees? Uh, yes, Mr. President. I'd like to move to suspend uh, Rule 10-3 to announce the hearing. Without objection, uh, the rules will be suspended. The rules are suspended. Uh, to recognize this, Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the committee, health committee will have a hearing on Tuesday, July 28th at 10.05 a.m. on uh, resolution 20-0231, informational hearing on bringing back Victory Gardens. And the health committee will be also having a hearing on bill number 20-0510 on Tuesday, July 14th, 2020 at 10 a.m for Bill uh, 20-0510, Trauma-Informed Care Task Force Composition, Revisions and Clarification. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Labor Committee, Councilman Smith. Yes, I have, um, Labor Committee will have a hearing on Thursday, July 16th for Bill 20-0543 um, on Thursday, July 16th at 1 p.m. for the purpose of acquiring certain successor businesses employers uh, taking control over certain businesses from the incumbent businesses, employees, employers to retain certain employees. Um, and then the other one we have is 20-0544, Thursday, July 16th as well at 1.05 p.m. for the purpose of requiring certain employers to recall certain employees who have been laid off after um, COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, land Use Committee, Councilman Rossiga. Mr. President, the Land Use Committee will hold a hearing on Tuesday, July 28th at 10 a.m. on Resolution 19-0159. This is an invest investigative hearing in regards to building backups of untreated sewage. Uh, the committee will also hold a hearing on the land use. Yeah, the land use committee will hold a hearing on Wednesday, Wednesday July 29th at 1 p.m. on Bill 
1027 and to rezoning located at 1020 West Press Street. Mr. President, I just want to settle back to the uh, first committee hearing uh, I missed. This is going to be televised on Strong TV. That's it, uh, 10 a.m. July 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Public Safety Committee. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. The Public Safety Committee will be hearing um, Bill Number 19-0431, Towing, Licensing, and Regulations, on Tuesday, July 7th at 4 p.m. Thank you. Uh, taxation, Finance, Economic Development, Madam Vice President. No announcements at this time. Thank you. Transportation Committee, Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to ask you to suspend the rules necessary to be able to announce a hearing. Without objection, the rules will be suspended. The rules are suspended. Chair recognizes Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. President. The Transportation Committee will hold a hearing on Wednesday, July 8th at 3 p.m. on Council Bill 20-0542, Commercial Vehicle Parking, uh, introduced by Councilman Henry. Thank you. And, and sorry, Councilman Bullock, I, I didn't mean to skip you, but Housing and Urban Affairs Committee. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to move to suspend rules to announce a hearing for a bill that was introduced at the last meeting. Without objection, the rules will be suspended. Rules are suspended. Chair recognizes Councilman Bullock. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Housing and Affairs Committee will be having a hearing at 2.10 p.m. on Tuesday, July 28th for City Council Bill 20-0538, Ordinance City Streets closed in two portions of East Cromwell Street. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A regular announcement. Uh, let me first start off by saying in regular announcement that we all need to wish uh, Councilwoman Clark a happy birthday. Uh, her birthday is today. So happy birthday, Councilwoman Clark, or as we like to say, uh, Council President for Life, uh, uh, Council Clint Clark. So thank you and happy birthday, ma'am. Thank you so much as always for your dedicated service. I would also like to ask that uh, Councilman Milton honor a moment of silence for the now 153 uh, victims of homicide that we've had in Baltimore uh, thus far this year, all those we've lost to overdose and COVID-19 as well. And I would like to say that we, we know there's a lot being said about public safety in Baltimore and around the country. And I think that we have to understand that we are talking about reimagining public safety. And that's going to be a very intensive thing for all of us to go through. But we know that Baltimore still has a lot of issues with, with violence in our city. And this, this weekend, this past week, we saw in Councilman Burnett's uh, district on uh, Thursday into Friday uh, something that is unspeakable. When you have a, a, a toddler and a pregnant woman uh, be shot, it shows how far we have to go, but it also shows how many types of issues that we must work on, how we have to deal with things on the front end as well, dealing with things like intimate partner violence. And I just want to take this moment to say that anybody in Baltimore City, a man or woman who is actually experiencing that right now, especially as we are all uh, forced really to spend a lot more time with each other, please speak up of uh, how we have to deal with the fact that we have to uh, teach people how to deal with their issues in a different way, especially this message is to our young men in, across Baltimore City and helping them understand that they do not own these young women. These young women are not their property, and we have to do a better job of raising them up to understand that, showing them how they can deal their conflict in a different way, and also being there to mentor them uh, through issues. And this also shows how much work we have to do around health and mental health in Baltimore City and trauma because we now, in addition to having a focus on the flow of illegal guns and all the other things that we know that we have to do from a policing standpoint, because we now have families who are dealing with a unspeakable amount of trauma. We are going to be celebrating a new life 
coming into the world and instead of now mourning uh, of the loss of three lives that will never, will never be able to reach their full promise. So I would like to ask for a moment of silence and hope that we all understand the, the depth of this issue that we're all staring down. Anyone else has any other regular announcements? Councilwoman Clark, Yes, thank you. Um, this is a regular announcement. I, I would just like to say that I've been around, as everyone knows, a long, long time. And in the years that I have, and have served on this council and lived as a citizen of Baltimore, I have seen one fire company after another pulled out. And here we are again. Now, when I had an emergency in my home, a medical emergency, I can promise you that the, that the engine company was the first to arrive and to help my relative come back, back to consciousness. Then came the medics because that's how it works. Furthermore, these companies bring to the neighborhoods where they're located a sense of security, a refuge from the storm, and, and a sense that they're part of the city and the city's caring about them. I know it's uh, almost $4 million worth of people, of, of savings, but there's no way to compare that to saving one life or saving one neighborhood's sense of, a sense of being a neighborhood in this city that has all the kinds of services we most desperately need. And fire is one of them. I'm just saying that now because there are going to be gatherings this week. There are going to be, we cannot just, and I know this council, I know this council and its leadership have tried very, very hard already that we didn't even have to have this in the budget, this big hole. But now, despite all the efforts, and thank you for that, Mr. President, and other members of the council and, and of the um, budget, um, basically, we have it and we can't. We've lost enough companies through the years and that should have ended a long time ago because the need has only grown. And these are not just companies that put out, that go to fires. They're, they go home to our homes and save our lives and waiting for the medics who are so overworked to get there and, and help. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Councilwoman, I want you to be sure to check your... Uh your porch for your birthday gift in my office. Oh, Mr. President, I already did, and I already have a young lady that serves as your clerk that's loving seeing it, and so um, I may have to give it away to her, but I knew. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Miss Lucy, little Lucy, who adores you. She recognizes Councilman Rosinger. Yeah. Councilman, hold on, you're on mute. Now you're good. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Mr. President. Happy birthday, Councilwoman Clark. I, Mr. President and my colleagues, I just want to piggyback on what Councilwoman Clark was talking about, the engine companies. I have Engine 55 in my district, and they said they did an analysis, you know, from the mayor's office. And I have three schools. I have a stadium, I have the casino, I have a hotel. That's not counting the residents, the small businesses, and also the industrial parks that's in my district. And they want to close the engine company. And it's not just for fires, but when it takes time for the ambulance to get there, you can always count on an engine truck or a ladder truck to get there first. So I don't understand the wisdom or the reason wanting to close two firehouses, I mean companies. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilman Cohen. Thank you, Mr. President. And to piggyback off of that point and tie it into yours as well, we are, again, in this budget, seeing a slight cut to youth and trauma services in the health department. Uh, having just passed 
uh, for any large city, the nation's most sweeping law related to reducing childhood trauma. Um, to cut money from that line item sends a very, very, very wrong signal, um, just like cutting fire stations as well. Um, would, again, implore the mayor uh, to fully fund legislation that he just signed. Thank you. Uh, any other regular announcements? Councilman Dorsey? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Council President. Um, I actually wasn't going to make anyone, but you seem to just be inclined to call on me. So thank you. Um, I, um, I just recently made a pledge to myself that I'm going to save one tree from English Ivy every week. Um, and so if there is anybody in my district who has a tree on their property that's being overtaken with English ivy, the only thing that I hate more in this world than the spy plane is English ivy. And so I will come to your house and I will free your trees of English ivy. If you'd like to, you can get in touch with me. You can email my office. You can call my office. Um, and anybody who uh, wants to come out and learn about invasive vine removal, I would be glad to have you come along and we can free up even more trees. Um, and, uh, and if any of my colleagues would like me to come over to their district and free up a tree and show you what it's all about, uh, I will be there. You just let me know. Um, I really love getting rid of English ivy, and so I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other regular announcements? Chair recognizes Council Vice President Middleton. Meeting of the City Council will be held on Monday, July 6, 2020, at 5 p.m., and may we have a moment of silence for the 153 victims of homicide, our continued epidemic, opioid epidemic, and our continued COVID-19 epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. There being no further business, this concludes the 86th meeting on the 72nd term of the Baltimore City Council.